Hi everybody, welcome once again to Good Gift City Church Online. It's so wonderful to have all of you coming regularly to join us in this time of worship, ministering to the Lord and receiving His Word and then hopefully ministering to each other. Let's look forward to a great time, okay? Let's pray, let's uh, offer up ourselves to the Lord, focus on all that He's doing with us, praising Him, worshipping Him with all that we are and have. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for bringing us together again across the waves, across different time zones, and most of all, Lord, together in unity to minister to you as of the Lord, God Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, who can have a better and a greater Heavenly Father than we have? Which nation on earth, which people in this world has a God like ours who came to die for our sins and bring us into your kingdom and filling us with your own Holy Spirit, preparing good things for our lives. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So receive our praises and our worship the meditations of our heart and the utterances of our lips. In Jesus' name, we all say, Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 to 9. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger, of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me, and He has said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, and my power is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul responds, Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. So let us declare and trust that the grace of our Lord is enough for us in any situation.
few songs, um, I just want to ask us a series of questions for our own self-examination um, and allow the Holy Spirit to reveal things to us which we were previously blinded to. I'm, I'm, I'm going to start with this. What are the things that we are fearful of? What are the things we are fearful of? Is it a failed relationship? Is it failure to meet an expectation? And maybe for some of us who are younger, it could be something as simple as the fear of darkness or the fear of heights. Let's take a look at what the Bible says about fear. 1 John 4.18 There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. So the one who fears is not made perfect in love. And also Isaiah 43 verse 1. But now this is what the Lord says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. And you are mine. Let's sing this next song knowing that our God has redeemed us. And we do not need to fear of anything. Every anxious thought that steals my breath It's a heavy weight upon my chest As I lie awake and wonder what the future will hold Help me to remember that you're in control You're my courage when I worry in the dead of night you're my strength cause I'm not strong enough to win this fight You are greater than the battle raging in my mind I will trust you Lord, I will fear no I lift my eyes, I will lift my eyes, I will lift my cares Lay them in your hands, I will defend them the wind and waves are coming to shelter me. Even though I'm in the storm, the storm is not in me. You're my courage when I worry in the dead of night. You're my strength because I'm not strong enough to win this fight. You are greater than the battle. against me cause you have overcome come on sing it no darkness can overwhelm me cause you already won no power no power can come against me cause you have overcome no darkness can overwhelm me cause you've already won you're my courage when I worry in the dead of night you're my strength cause I'm to win this fight You are greater than the battle raging in my mind I will trust you, Lord I will 
my next question is, what do we cling on to? Or what do we take pride in? For some of us, it's the things in our lives, like our jobs, our finances, our achievements. And for some of us, it's the people in our lives, like our friends, our parents, our family, our children. You know, do you find that when you have a problem, we try to use our own strength to solve it? I know I do. And sometimes I ask myself, where is God in this picture? And oftentimes I forget that victory belongs to our God. You know, this next song is a good reminder for us that every victory belongs to our God and our God alone. Sing, I'll fight. I'll fight is with weapons unseen. Your enemies crash through theirs. So we rise up in worship. Yes, God, we rise up in worship. When trials unleash like a flood. The 
Church, my last question is this. Do we find that there are some things in our lives that we need to have control over? Do we find that there are some things in our lives that we need to have control over? You know, I just want us to take a minute now to allow the Holy Spirit to reveal it to us. Holy Spirit, what are the things that we need control over? And then you ask Him, ask the Holy Spirit if He wants you to release it to Him. Ask Him that. Do you feel like you need to be in control of your future? Ask Him that. You know, in Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. You know, as the Holy Spirit reveals these things to us, let's ask ourselves, will we give up control over the things that needs to be given up? Recognizing and trusting that our God is God of all. Our God is God over everything. Do we believe that?
You are the God of creation. God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of time. Point of reference, you spoke to the dark and flashed out the wonder of light. And as you speak, and as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born in the vapor of your breath. Stars are made to worship, so will I. I can see your heart in everything you made. Every burning star is signal fire. Creation sings your praises, so will I. God of your promise, God of your promise, I don't speak in vain, no syllable empty or For once you have spoken, nature and science follow the sound of your voice. You speak, a hundred billion creatures catch your breath, revolving in pursuit of what you Then all reveals in nature so alive. I can see your heart, I can see your heart in everything. Say, every painted sky and canvas of your creation still obeys you so
sovereign, you're above everything, above our problems, our situation, our circumstance. Help us to see that, help us to surrender and trust. Thank you, Lord. It's Holy Communion weekend once again. I trust you have the element ready, the bread or biscuit, the wine or grape juice with you. But before we do that, shall we have a short prayer? Father, we thank you for this privilege of celebrating this very important time of Holy Communion with all our fellow believers. Father, we ask that you will bless this time. Continue, O God, to help us to remember your death as often as possible as we partake of this Holy Communion. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Holy Communion or the Lord's Supper is taken in remembrance of what our Saviour, our Lord Jesus Christ, has done for us on the cross. Holy Communion is not a ritual to be observed, but a blessing to be received. When you eat the bread by His stripes that fell on His back, your body is healed from the crown of your head to the very sole of your feet. The bread represents Jesus' body that was couched and broken during his crucifixion. And the cup represents his blood shed for the forgiveness of our sin. Jesus implemented Holy Communion through the Last Supper he shared with his disciples. He took bread and when he had broken it, said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. At the cross, God took all our sicknesses and diseases and put them on Jesus' originally perfect and healthy body so that we can walk in divine health. The Bible says, by His stripes we are healed, in Isaiah 53 verse 5. But He was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sin. He was beaten so we could be made whole. He was whipped, so we could be healed. He personally carried our sins in His body on the cross, so that we can be dead to sin and live what is right. By His wounds, you are healed, First Peter 2.24 says. 
There is healing in the bread when you partake in Holy Communion, in remembrance of what Jesus did on the cross. In Luke chapter 22, verse 20, Jesus tells us that the cup is the new covenant between God and His people, an agreement confirmed with Jesus' blood, which was poured out as a sacrifice for you and me. Apostle Paul tells us that the blood of Jesus brings forgiveness of sin. Colossians chapter 1, verse 14 says, Who purchased our freedom and forgive our sin. Hebrews chapter 4, 16 says, So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God and be mindful that Holy Communion is God's ordained channel of healing and wholeness for our body. With that, let's pray together by looking at the screen right now. Father, in Jesus' name, according to your word, Jesus' body was broken for us. We acknowledge that he bore our sin, our sickness, our sorrow, our grief, our fear, and our torment. Through his blood, we have complete redemption, total deliverance from the works of Satan. As new creation, we are free, redeemed, and forgiven in Jesus' name. As we partake of this bread, your broken body, we receive our wholeness. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, we examine ourselves, we judge ourselves according to the authority of your word. In areas where we have missed the mark, covetousness, fear, worry, and unbelief, we take Jesus as our advocate and high priest. We ask for forgiveness according to the word of God. Your word says you are faithful and just to forgive us when we confess our sins and that you will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, we give you thanks for all you have provided for us in Christ Jesus. We declare this day that you are abundantly blessed, we are highly favoured, and we are exceedingly loved. This covenant we entered into is a covenant filled with exceedingly great and precious promises of God. And we are partakers of those promises now. Father, we give you thanks for all you have provided for us in Christ Jesus. We declare this day that we are abundantly blessed, we are highly favoured, and we are exceedingly loved. We are healed, we are redeemed, we are delivered from the power of darkness. We are the head and not the tail. We are above and not beneath. All that we set our hands to do, we will prosper in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let us take our elements up. Firstly, our bread. If you are ready, if you are a couple, you are a husband and wife, you may want to serve each other. All right? You may serve each other. And, um, and we all know that Holy Communion is not a ritual to be observed, but a blessing to be received. So when you eat the bread by His stripes that fell on His back, we recognize that when we partake, whatever sicknesses, disease, claim it in Jesus' name. So, together, Father, we thank you for this bread, which represents your body that was crucified on the cross at Calvary for my sake. I now eat it and I claim healing for my body and for my health. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's together hold up the, the cup. This cup represents the blood of Jesus that was shed 
on the cross at Calvary for your sake and my sake. As you partake it, let's remember, claim forgiveness for your sin. Father, we thank you that as we partake, we know for a fact that our sins are forgiven as we partake. Let's partake together. Let's drink together. Father, we thank you. We praise you for this time. We ask that you will continue, O oh God, to watch over our lives. As we surrender our lives to you, we thank you for this time that we can remember your death and we claim total healing and we know that we will ever be healthier because of what you have done on the cross at Calvary for our sake. And Father, we can claim forgiveness as we confess our sins to you each day. We thank you for this wonderful provision of healing and forgiveness of our sin. We thank you for this time. Thank you for watching our lives. We commit our family, our loved ones, our friends, our neighbours into your precious hand. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Once again, I trust you have enjoyed that worship and sharing the communion with one another you know the communion once again is not just a ritual but it's a it's a experience of connecting with the lord through physical elements the bread the wine you know the juice they present to us the presence of the lord the sacrifice reminding us of the sacrifice of the lord jesus christ and what through that sacrifice the benefits that come to us spiritually, physically, emotionally, relationally. So hold that in your heart, even as you have shared uh, that exchange of uh, elements, the body and the bread, and uh, the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now some announcements. Uh, first and foremost, I'm happy to announce that at the end of this month, the 27th of February, Saturday, the 27th of February. We're going to have another physical gathering uh, subject to the restrictions and the precautions that we've been given. Okay, and uh, you can see the link there. You can click it. We'll bring you to the place where you can register. Please do that early because we're limited to a hundred people only. Okay. Then our cell groups, once again, I encourage you to come into one. Uh, even though you may be overseas, if the time and dates and days are convenient for you, get in, engaged in a community so that we can share, we can pray and support one another as we go through life together. Hallelujah. So let's continue to focus on the Lord as we carry on with the rest of the service.
listening, I'm listening. Quiet my heart, I'm listening. Oh, quiet my heart, I'm listening. Let's recap. Some of the things we have been talking about the last few weeks in this series on successful living. First of all, we were very clear, success is not just about wealth, fame or position, although they sometimes come with them. Primarily, success is fulfillment of purpose. Everything that has been made by God has a purpose. So, I want us to say after me, right now, everybody, I am made, I am loved, I have purpose. Did you get it? One, one more time, okay? We're feeling. I am made, I am loved, I have purpose. Three statements. You need to always speak out, remember, you are created by Almighty God, you are loved by Him, you know, you're proud of everything you made yourself, right? So remember this, God is also proud of you. You love the things you made. You don't like people to criticize the things that you have made with your own hands. So in the same way, God feels that about you too. And thirdly, everything that you have made has a function, has a purpose. Similarly with you. God has a wonderful purpose for your life. God wants us to be successful because He's our Father. Yeah, he's in the business of saving, restoring people. And nobody in business wants to fail. Scripture declares that He has plans for us, for our good, for prosperity, a hope and a future. Remember 3 John chapter 2? Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. It expresses God's desire for us. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11. Read together. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and future. Today, I want to talk to you about your purpose. I believe every person is created for a wonderful purpose. God has created us in His image. Think about this for a minute. We have been made in the likeness of God. In other words, you are an amazing piece of work. Now, I know that some of you listening to me may find this hard to believe. But that's not how you, and that's not how you see or feel about yourself. But consider this. Can the Almighty God produce junk? Can the Almighty God create junk? As an African-American pastor would say, God doesn't make no junk. God doesn't make no junk. And I go to Psalm 139 and verse 14. Psalm 139 verse 14. Say together, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, my soul knows it very well. God says, God is reminding all of us that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And our soul, that means our mind, must dwell in it and remember it. Today is lesson four on successful living. And I want to talk to you about becoming a giant killer. Everybody say, giant killer. If you are with somebody, turn to that person, point your finger at him or her and say, you are a giant killer. If you are not yet, you will become one. 
Okay? Let's read together the familiar story from 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 20 to 52. It's a long passage, but I'd like us to be patient. Uh, we need to plow through uh, some of the details in this wonderful story. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 20 to 52. If you have a Bible with you, whatever form, please try and follow. Okay? But let's all read together as the words appear on screen. So David left the sheep with another shepherd and set out the next morning with the gifts, as Jesse had directed him. He arrived at the camp just as the Israelite army was leaving for the battlefield with shouts and battle cries. Soon the Israelite and Philistine forces stood facing each other, army against army. David left his things with the keeper of supplies and hurried out to the ranks to greet his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, came out from the Philistine ranks. Then David heard him shout his usual taunt to the army of Israel. As soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away in fright. Have you seen the giant? The man asked. He comes out each day to defy Israel. The king has offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him. He will give that man one of his daughters for a wife, and the man's entire family will be exempted from paying taxes. David asked the soldiers standing nearby, What will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan Philistine anyway, that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? And this man gave David the same reply. They said, yes, that is the reward for killing him. But when David's oldest brother, Eliab, heard David talking to the man, he was angry. What are you doing around here anyway? He demanded. What about those few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? I know about your pride and deceit. You just want to see the battle. What have I done now? David replied. I was only asking a question. He walked over to some others and asked them the same thing and received the same answer. Then David's question was reported to King Saul and the king sent for him. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy and he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. When a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal, if the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I will do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. Then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like for he had never worn such things before. I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them into his shepherd's bag. Then, armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Goliath walked out toward David with his shield-bearer ahead of him. Sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy, Am I a dog? He roared at David. That you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. David replied to the Philistine, You come to me with sword, spear and javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today, the Lord will conquer you and I will kill you and cut 
off your head. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. Reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. Then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath. David used it to kill him and cut off his head. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah gave a great shout of triumph and rushed after the Philistines, chasing them as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron. The bodies of the dead and wounded Philistines were strewn all along the road from Sha'arim as far as Gath and Ekron. All of us have giants in our lives. Giants represent issues, hang-ups, beliefs, or even personalities that challenge our faith and our development as men and women in Christ. The Philistine army was demoralized and paralyzed by Goliath. We too can be bullied by our giants. Like David, we can and we need to confront and defeat them. Take a minute to identify one giant you need to defeat. Put your answer in the comment box and post it. Let's share a little bit, okay? What is the one giant that you know that's been bullying you? Put it down. Let's identify that fellow and name him and we will face him together today. Are you done? Okay. With just a few words. You know what it is in your heart and mind. Share it. Okay. Thank you. David defeated his giant with five smooth stones. I want to take the stones David used against Goliath to represent five aspects of achieving our life's purpose by knocking out giants. So five stones to knock out giants. Stone number one is a great cause to pursue. Great cause to pursue. Read with me 1 Samuel chapter 17 verses 25 to 26. Now the Israelites have been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will examine his, fa his father's family from Texas in Israel. David asked the man standing near him, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? God's people were defeated and helpless. God was being ridiculed. You know, little people have great wishes. Great people have great causes. Many Christians forget that Christianity is actually a great cause, not just a little religion for our comfort. We have a vision and a cause to bring the knowledge of Jesus Christ to all mankind. We have the great purpose of calling all men to come under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. 
This is something that will happen. Jesus is returning to earth to be judge and king soon. I'm into a course that cannot fail. I have a purpose in life that will be completed. Let's look at this little acrostic on the word purpose. Purpose is spelled P-U-R-P-O-S-E. Right? P stands for pray more. U stands for unite more. R stands for risk more. P stands for plan more. O stands for observe more. S for sacrifice more. And E for expect more. This is what purpose is all about. Pray, unite with other brothers and sisters, take risks, plan, learn, observe, sacrifice, and expect great results from God. You see, the difference between an ordinary person and an extraordinary person comes from this word, cause. The cause, the purpose for what we are living for. So that's the first stone. We have a great cause. Stone number two is a price to pay. What price did David have to pay? Well, first and foremost, his own brother scoffed at him. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 28, we read there, it says, When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with a man, he burned with anger at him and asked, Why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. David was accused of almost everything under the sun. Uh, he was deemed irresponsible, uh, leaving uh, his work behind, prideful, uh, conceited, and then wicked, and just being childish, wanting some entertainment. As if that wasn't enough, King Saul himself ridiculed him. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 33, Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. The first price we pay in championing a great cause is often criticism and loneliness. Yeah, even your own family members may not support you. Even the one uh, who's supposed to lead you may say that you are crazy. You know, every, every person who's never killed a giant will say that you are crazy or try to, or, or to, for trying or tell you that it cannot be done. Because they've never done it before, right? Anyone who's ever participated in anything worthwhile encounters attacks and criticism. Here, David was willing to risk his own life and take on what everyone else, including his brothers and king, were avoiding. Yet, he was accused of just looking for fun and games and being stupid. It can be discouraging and yes, pretty lonely sometimes. So that's one price he has to pay. The second one has to do with what I call unsuitable resources. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 38 to 39, Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. This is very interesting and actually quite uh, revelatory because King Saul was offering his own personal arsenal to David. Just think, right, what kind of equipment would the king have? It must be the best in the army, right? The state of the art weapon, so to speak. In declining the king's offer, David also ran the risk of offending his majesty. In this instance, Saul was doing what he thought was best for David, but it was not suitable for the young man. The implication here is that Saul may be trying to tell David how to fight the giant. 
He himself did not take up the challenge, but he would like to tell David how to do it. You know, use this and, and try this and so forth. And you know, this is so true. You will find that the very people who doesn't want to risk themselves will tell you how to do your job. I, was, I once heard someone said, I would very much like to serve God in an advisory capacity. Not long ago, a young couple in church started a family. Soon someone told me they wanted to leave our small church because they say we're not providing a ministry for their child. So it was suggested to them they should start something themselves. Oh, but no, they want it, but are not willing to do anything about it. There is no sacrifice. There is no risk. One of the concerns we face today in the Singapore church is that people are called by the Lord to serve, but they are unwilling to adjust their lifestyles to make themselves available to do God's work. And on top of this, there is a very popular teaching where God's blessings for us are so emphasized to the point that the issues of sacrifice and dying to self are never taught. I was told of one group of churches uh, that's all around the world, have branches in uh, many places in the world, that, that nobody who goes to their churches should ever feel uncomfortable. What is being produced is a me first mindset in churchgoers. They shop around for a ministry or church that caters to their lifestyle. They are what I call consumers, not contributors. There's a man called David Livingston. Some of you may have heard of him. David Livingston charted great paths for missions work in Africa. And one time, a missionary society wrote to him and say, we have some people who would like to join you. Do you have easy access roads to get to where you are? Livingston wrote back, if you have men who would come only if there are easy roads, then I don't want them. I want men who would come even if there is no road at all. There is a cost of loneliness and sacrifice when we go for a big cause, when we want to fulfill God's purpose in our life. You know, sometimes the church has been described like a, to be like a soccer match. You know, you, you watched soccer before or you, you played soccer before? You know, what happens in a soccer match, especially one of these big matches, many of these big matches, right? You have 22 men running their hearts out desperately in need of a rest. Then there are 22,000 people on the terraces yelling their lungs out desperately in need of exercise. That's what the church has often been described as. You know, a few guys trying to do most of the work where the rest are sitting in the comfort of their pews, soaking it in, and then telling others how they should be doing the job. It's been said, if you have nothing worth dying for, you have nothing worth living for. Can you say that together with me? If you have nothing worth dying for, you will have nothing worth living for. You may want to discuss that uh, in your cell groups. To defeat your giant, you must be willing to pay a price. That's stone number two. Stone number three from David's bag is a track record of past success. A track record of past success. 1 Samuel chapter 17, 34 to 36. Read with me. David said to Saul, Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. 
Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. David has a record of fighting wild animals. He has learned how to overcome odds to get victory. He built up small successes in his life. Remember, true success in life is never instantaneous. People sometimes think that if, it, if only they could strike rich, you know, buy a big a lottery ticket and, and, and get it uh, first prize, and, or hit it big through some uh, get-rich-quick uh, scheme, then they will have smooth sailing all the way. In fact, success is not like that. It's built upon small accomplishments over a period of time. Often people would hold back on doing something important because they think the job requires things they don't possess. They excuse themselves by saying things like, I'm not educated enough, you know, or I'm not spiritual enough, yeah, I, I don't have that gift, and so on and so forth. Let's look at Exodus chapter 4, verses 1 to 5, where we have uh, some of these issues being dealt with. Yeah. Then read together, then Moses answered, But behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice. For they will say, The Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? He said, A staff. And the Lord said, Throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent, and Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, Put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand, that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. This passage of scripture has to do with the call of Moses to go back to Egypt to deliver his people from slavery. A great cause. Moses tried to excuse himself with all kinds of reasons. This was the first of many. And the people will not believe me or listen to me. Now Moses was actually right. The Israelites didn't quite believe him or follow him. But God's answer was, what's that in your hand? Well, what was that? It was, his, it was Moses' walking stick, if you like. And God said, throw it down. And when Moses did, it became a snake that shocked Moses. Then God said, catch the snake by the tail. And when Moses did that, it returned to being a piece of wood. There are two miracles here. First, the staff turned into a serpent. And that in itself was quite astounding, right? Secondly, it was catching the serpent by the tail. Anyone who knows anything about snakes will tell you it's the wrong way to catch a snake. If you catch a snake by the tail, it will just simply spin around and dig its poisonous fangs into your hand. You always deal with snakes from its head. God is showing Moses all he needed was the staff he had all his adult life. Miracles are performed with the simple things we possess. Remember, Jesus Christ once fed 5,000 men with only five loaves and two fish. A small boy's lunch, so to speak. What you already know and have is a good place to start. God can use it to produce miracles. What did David have? Five stones and a sling. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, 48 to 50, we read, when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. David knew that he cannot have close quarter hand-to-hand -hand combat with a guy who's three to four times his size. In other words, to fight this giant, he needs to be nimble 
and fast on his feet, plus something that he can use for, uh, to hit Goliath with before the giant can get near him. What David used was a sling and a stone. Now, you should know that the sling and stone used by David is not what some of us were taught in Sunday school. Okay? Many Christian kids were taught this song. I, I don't know where some of you were. It goes like this. Only a boy named David, only a rippling brook. Only a boy named David, five little stones he took. Then one little stone went in the sling, and the sling went round and round. Round and round and round and round and round and round and round. Then one little stone went up, 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 and the giant came a tumbling down. I would love to sing it for you, but then you may want to, you may, you may switch off your, 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 your streaming, okay? This children's song has given us the impression that Goliath was killed by a little pebble. But actually, the stone in the sling is a powerful weapon in those days, especially in the right hand. Here's a picture of one, of one and a sample of the stones used. As you can see, the stones are not small nor pebble-like. They are more like tennis balls. You must know your capabilities and the resources at your disposal. David struck with his own equipment because he has seen what miracles they could do. He turned down Saul's armor because they would hinder his movements, even though they're the best the army had to offer. He knows what is needed to do the job. I want you to think about this and imagine this. And David was a shepherd boy. What do you think he would, he would be doing when the sheep were grazing? Right? They're all busy uh, feeding themselves. What would this young man be doing? Well, obviously, being David, he would play his harp and perhaps compose some of his songs that we know today uh, to be the Psalms. But like most young boys, he would also be practicing his slingshots. Imagine this, okay? Here's David, sitting down under the sh a shade of a rock, and he's looking around, looking at the sheep, you know, surveying the, uh, the places to make sure that his sheep are okay. And then he sees a small tree, maybe 30 meters away. He says, let me see whether I can hit that tree from here. And he would spin his sling and launch his stone. Then he sees a, a little animal, maybe 25 meters out. There's a baby deer. <laughs> Let's see if I can have some venison stew tonight. Yeah, he would try, swing his, his sling and let the stone go after that little baby deer. That wolf, that wolf stalking my little lamb. Take that <laughs> yeah, and got you. Don't you dare come here again. I want to submit to you, that's where his accuracy came from. You must know what you need to do to get the job done. That's David's fourth stone. Little successes, practicing, learning, uh, a, a, a acquiring skill, sharpening uh, his abilities. Stone number four, an almighty God to trust. In 1 Samuel, Chapter uh, 17 and verse 45, David said to the Philistine, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the, is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. Ultimately, it's Almighty God. This is David's stone. The Lord God Almighty is on his side. Here are a couple of scriptures to reinforce that. Okay, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, 
I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Come on, declare this. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Secondly, from Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. God says here that we can do amazing things. Now this is not about doing anything or everything I want, but about fulfilling assignments and commands relating to God's purpose for my life. Whatever God has purpose in my life to do, I can do. Yeah? He has put His power within me by His Holy Spirit. That stone number four, and I summarize it by giving this to you. Measure your possibilities, measure your possibilities, not by what you see in yourself, but what you see in God through you. So your possibilities are not what you see in yourself. You know, sometimes when we look into ourselves, we don't see very much, right? And that's helpful sometimes, because then we turn to God. Uh, it is what you see in God through you. God is within me and He's functioning, He's operating through me. You know, sometimes Christians have this uh, uh, idea that, you know, I, I, I don't want anything, I don't want things to be just done by myself. You know, I want it all to be God. But actually, that is not an accurate way to understand things. God always works in us and through us. So it's always God and me. All right? It's never just God. It's never just me. So you have to understand this. God, by the Spirit, lives in you. He moves through you. So that stone, number four, is an almighty God working in you, through you. Then stone number five, a big target to hit. 1 Samuel chapter 17, 48 to 50. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, David quickly ran toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. Someone said this, the, Phil the Israelite soldiers see Goliath as too big to fight. David sees Goliath as too big to miss. I like that, don't you? What this means is that when your goals are clear, it's not difficult to succeed. You see, what you see is what you get. Can you see yourself hitting the goal? What would define that for you? So, the clarity, okay, the clarity of what God is doing within you, who you are in God, the, the things that the Lord has put into your hand, and your ability to use them with practice will prove to be the trump card in your life. You know, there was a time that athletes say that the four-minute mile cannot be broken. Some of you would have heard this story before. There were even medical articles, medical articles that said from the physical point of view, a human body cannot do a four-minute mile run, to run the mile in four minutes, in other words. They say the human body won't be able to handle the pressure. But on May the 6th, 1954, a man by the name of Roger Gilbert Bannister proved them all wrong. He made track history. By the way, he was also a medical doctor. He was a neurologist, actually. He made track history when he became the first person to run the one mile in less than four minutes. He was at that time in Oxford as a medical student. 
and Bannister broke the so-called four-minute barrier with a time of three minutes, 59.4 seconds in the Helsinki Olympic Games. Bannister said this after his epic run. However ordinary each of us may seem, we are all in some way special and can do things that are extraordinary, perhaps until then thought impossible. Another runner by the name of John Landy set a new record at 3 minutes and 58 seconds just 46 days later. Within two years, 213 men did it. Today, no respectable runner does it in more than four minutes. Then another event called the uh, high jump. <laughs> when I was in school, I attempted the high jump. I'm afraid, not very good. The so-called impossible barrier was seven feet. Until a man called Richard Douglas Fosbury came along. Fosbury had difficulty competing using the dominant high jumping techniques of the period. The dominant technique called the Stradle method was a complex motion where an athlete went over the high jump bar face down, lifting his legs individually over the bar. Fosbury found it difficult to coordinate all the motions involved in the straddle method and began to experiment with other ways of doing the high jump. The technique he designed gained the name Fosbury Flop. <laughs> a reporter wrote that he looked like a fish flopping in a boat. Others were even less kind, with one newspaper captioning Fosbury's photograph as the world's laziest high jumper. But in 1968, at the Olympics in Mexico City, Fosbury took the gold medal and set a new Olympic record at 2.24 meters, seven feet, four and a quarter inches. Today, the world record stands at 2.45 meters, eight feet and a quarter inch helped by a Cuban athlete named Javier Sotomayor using the Fosbury flop, which had by then became the standard technique for the high jump. Here's a poem for us to remember. Let's say it together. Are you ready? If you think you are beaten, you are. If you think you dare not, you don't. If you like to win, but think you can't, it's almost certain you won't. Life's battles don't always go to the stronger or faster man. But sooner or later, the man who wins is the man who thinks he can. Did you get it? Capture it. Note it down somewhere. Okay, of course, you can always review it on Facebook or YouTube. I want to close with Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. Read together God's word. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God has prepared in advance for us to do. What the Word of God is saying here is that God has important work prepared for you to do. That's your purpose. Fulfilling God's assignments for your life. That's our purpose. And conquering giants on the way to completing them. What would you like to be remembered for? after you leave this planet. I'm going to share with you one giant I had to face and learn to kill. It's called Africa. When I came to the Lord and I responded to God's call to become a pastor, 
I said to the Lord, I will go anywhere you tell me, I'll do anything you want. But inside me, there was one thing, one place. Please don't send me to Africa. You know, I realized that actually many Christians are like that. You know, we can sing incredible words <laughs> yeah, for, in our worship. Uh, we can pray very heartfelt prayers about dedication and commitment, etc., etc. But actually, deep down inside all of us, there are little fears, reservations of what, about what God may do to us if we really totally, fully surrender ourselves to His ways and to His will. This was my giant. Anything, Lord, but. Have you heard that before? Within yourself? Anything, Lord, but. You know, in the last days, huh, Jesus said that the goats will be separated from the sheep. And the goats will be the one that will be cast, in, that will be cast into the outer darkness. Sheep will always go ba, ba, ba. Goats will always go but, but, but. So are you a goat or a sheep? <laughs> that was a question I have to ask myself. Anything, Lord, but. Anywhere, Lord, but. So, Lord, no Africa. Every time I think about Africa, right, you grow up reading people like uh, uh, David Livingstone going in, you know, all this uh, dealing with facing all this cannibalistic. So, my, my, my imagination about Africa is, if I go to Africa, there's this big, great big cooking pot waiting for me. So, anywhere but Africa. But God, in His grace, saw this giant. So this was my giant, you know, the fear about actually totally committing my life to Jesus Christ. What will he do to me? <laughs> you know, you've got these lies about God. You know, he's going to put you into the worst possible situation, make you do the most uh, the terrible of sacrifices. So we kind of balk at this complete yielding of ourselves to the Lord. And we, 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 we get suckered by Satan's lies. So I said, Okay, Lord, finally, I, I said, okay, I'll, I'll do anything. You know, I, I realized this was happening within me. And he sent me to Africa. I received an invitation one year. This was quite long ago, maybe in the 1980s, if I, if I remember correctly. But from an evangelist in Ghana. And he, he happened to be in Singapore. We got to know him. He actually, I got him to actually preach in our church. And then after that, we kind of kept in touch. And he said to me, you must come to my country and preach. So one year, he actually sent me a telegram. Now in those days, no mobile phone, okay? The, the, the quickest way of communication is called telegram. Not the telegram you have in your handphone. Huh? It's that old type of telegram, okay? <laughs> that, that requires you to key in things, go to the post office and you know, send a message. And then it's supposed to be the fastest, okay? So he sent me a telegram and says, come to my country and I arrange some meetings for you. So I went to talk and think about it. I said, oh, Africa, God, you're serious now. You know, this is the last place I want to go. Okay. And in those days, Africa was uh, run by a lot of these military generals. Yeah, so it was coup d'etat after coup d'etat, like what's just happened in Myanmar. You know, and these guys, you know, have total control of the country. They are, uh, in some ways, uh, dictatorial. And, and, and to keep their power, they, they would build up their arms, not to defend the, the country, uh, uh, defend the country against uh, outside enemies, but with, uh, to deal with political opponents in their land. So, I went to my staff. I said, what do you all think? Oh, my staff were very enthusiastic. Pastor, you must go. So, what to do, right? If my staff says, go, okay, I cannot say, I'm scared, lah, you know. So, anyway, so I started looking at uh, what is required to go to Ghana. First of all, I found out there was no diplomatic relationship between Singapore and Ghana. So, you can't get a visa, okay. Then, when it comes to preparing yourself medically, to, you know, some of these countries, you need jabs, right? 
So I couldn't find any information, so I got my secretary to look around and, and we found out that uh, there were a couple of diseases in Ghana. One was called yellow fever, the other one was called river blindness. So I went to the doctors. Nobody, no doctor in Singapore has heard about this. There's no jabs of this stuff, okay? No inoculation for this stuff. So I thought, okay, la, maybe no visa, right? I don't have to go out. I can't go, I can tell my friend in Ghana, thank you, but I can't come, no visa. So I text him actually, I said, I, I don't have a visa to come. So he texts me back, he said, Pastor, don't worry, I will wait for you at the airport. So when you come, I will meet you at the airport and bring you into the country. So. No choice, okay? When somebody offered like that. So I got a ticket and I flew to Ghana. It was a very long flight, okay? It was uh, in those days, um, okay, the SIA doesn't even go to that place. The capital was called Accra. And I think I have to go through Amsterdam or something like that, you know? But I think I flew Alitalia, the Italian airline, into. Uh, into uh, Amsterdam, spend one night there, and then catch the next morning flight into Accra. A long, long flight, like 20 over 24, 25 hours flight. So when I arrived in Ghana, in the airport, they had what is called a brownout, okay? That means there was a power shutdown, power outage, and the place was in darkness. And then ar around that time, my friend also told me that in Ghana, this, the, 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 the strong man, the military strong man who took over the, the country, his name is called Jerry Rawlings. He was a lieutenant in the Air Force. And he, and he actually attempted one coup before, failed, and this is the second one, and he succeeded. And when he, after he took over the place, he started to turn the country into a more socialist type country. At that time, uh, this uh, Egyptian uh, uh, strong man called uh, Gaddafi, Muhammad Gaddafi, had a lot of influence in Africa. I mean, he's got oil money, he's from Libya, okay? He had a lot of influence in the country, with a lot of oil money. And so they, he was uh, uh, encouraging a lot of religious fervor, a religious uh, form of religion, okay? Uh, that was very uh, powerful in, in, that, in that part of the world. And, a, and he produced what's called a green book, book similar to the red book that Mao Zedong produced. And there, there were a lot of young people marching on the streets, shouting slogans. And he was turning the country away from uh, its Christian roots. Actually, Ghana, in a lot of the black African countries have a lot of Christians, about maybe like 40% Christians. And, uh, and, and the church was coming under pressure. Uh, the economy was going down, people were suffering. And then as he was doing that, a, 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 a drought hit the country. It was a severe drought that lasted for three years. There was no money, there was no food, and terrible things were happening to the people. Famine was getting in, kicking into the country. Then, as a result of that, people became refugees, they started running out of the country to the next uh, uh, country called Togo. Okay, so masses of them were moving towards the border of Togo. When the government of Togo saw these Ghanaians coming, they closed the border. So there were refugees, thousands upon thousands of refugees just camped on the border of Togo and, uh, and, and, and Ghana. And they were starving. People were dying. Diseases were kicking in. And by then, the uh, President uh, Rawlings began to realize something needed to be done. Okay? So he started calling people to pray. After three years of, of drought, he called people to pray for the country. So the churches began to come together. They started gathering, or even, actually even before the President gave his call, they were coming together, they were fasting, they were praying, and in spite of the poverty, okay, the, 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 the difficult economic situations that the people were going through, they took up offerings. They took up offerings to buy food. 
and they would load up trucks with, with uh, these uh, provisions and the pastors would drive the trucks in convoy to the border to bring this food to all the refugees that were stuck there. And he tells me that when they arrived, it was scary because these people were starving and they would rush at the, at the trucks to get the food and the pastors would just throw the bread and run for cover or else they'll get mobbed. So this is what they do, okay? Send it, but they continue to pray, then the drought broke. The drought broke just before I arrived, a few weeks before I arrived. And when the rains come, the whole country begin to flourish. Actually, Ghana is a very beautiful country, very fertile land. Okay, so when I landed, they had just had the break of the of the of the drought, but economy was still very down. Okay, so that's why they have this uh, power outage even at the airport. So when I landed at the airport, the place was in darkness, and I was terrified. You know, if you don't mind, I, I have a little bit of a joke here. Don't take offense, okay? You know, when you're in Africa and the place is in darkness, all you see is teeth. Teeth floating around, okay? I'm like, That's my imagination running wild, okay? So anyway, got off the flight and I went to the customs of, uh, to the immigration counter and presented my Singapore passport. And the guy at the, at the counter, I, I think I was probably the only Asian uh, uh, passenger. So he took my passport, he flipped through it, he says, where's your visa? I said, I have no visa, I think your country don't have any kind of a diplomatic relationship with mine. Then he says, where is your vaccination for uh, yellow fever and river blindness? I, I, I asked him, I said, what's river blindness? He said, I don't know. So in my mind, he's like, Wow, if you look at the river, you go blind. Huh? Maybe it's like that, no? So scary, right? So he said, but where, where is your vaccination? If you need vaccination, it must be quite serious, right? So I said, my country don't have these diseases, so I can't get vaccination. He says, no visa, no vaccination. You cannot come into my country. Go back. Praise the Lord, I said in my heart. I was so happy. I turned around and started walking towards the plane that I just disembarked from. I was hoping just to take the same flight back out to Amsterdam. <laughs> but as I was walking towards the aircraft, I heard this. Go back. Go back. And I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, Satan get thee behind me and continue to walk towards the aircraft. And the voice said again, go back. Then I realized <laughs> I got the wrong person, right? So I sheepishly, quietly turned around, went back to the immigration counter, same officer. And I said to him, I must get into your country put the passport on the counter. So he took my passport, looked at it again and says, why do you want to come to my country? I said, I've been invited here to preach the word of God. And he looked at me and said, why didn't you tell me earlier? Open my passport, stamp, welcome, he said. So I took my passport and walked in. I said, what happened? I went out of the airport and my friend was there. He waited three days for me, sleeping on his little, uh, little bus. Okay, he had a little bus for transport, which actually, when he came to Singapore, we helped him to purchase. And uh, remember in those days, the fastest way of communication was by telegram. I had sent him a telegram, giving him my flight details, but he never received. So he waited three days for me. I arrived before the telegram. When, after we left the airport, he got the telegram the next day. <laughs> All right? so he, but he waited. So here I was in Ghana. Okay? And then I told him about my encounter at the immigration, uh, of, with the immigration officer. He said, Pastor, I want you to know what happened. You know, when the country was going through this terrible drought and economic crisis and all the refugee crisis, 
the church got together to pray. The church took offerings. And that's how I know, okay, to, 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 to help all our people on the border. We, we raised quite a lot of money. We, a lot of our people sacrificed, even though they themselves were going through a hard time to take care of our fellow countrymen. And then when the drought came, okay, through the prayers of the church, the whole country was very grateful. So now pastors, preachers, of the Christian gospel has a lot of respect. So that's why when you say you are coming here to preach the word of God, all the rules were put aside. So I was in Ghana, all right, and he helped me things for me. We had to drive a hundred kilom- uh, uh, kilometers to another to another city called Kumasi, about hundred uh, kilometers north of the capital, and uh, we started having meetings. Okay, and the power of God came down upon those meetings. Literally, okay, I had people, the place, maybe a thousand over people will come into the church and uh, after preaching, you know, uh, there were all kinds of sick people, people with crutches, people with bandages, people who were blind, who were deaf, all kinds of sicknesses. And, and my friend tells me, you know, this is what's happening in, in the country because of the military uh, the coup, the, this military guys running the country, that the country is bankrupt because all the money they took uh, was uh, for some other purposes rather than taking care of the people. When a mother sends a child, a sick child to the hospital, the doctor will examine the baby, tell them what the diagnosis is, and then say, look at the shelves, they're empty. There are no drugs, there are no medicine available. Take your child home. That's all they could do. So the whole country was suffering. So you can imagine, right, in a service where you pray for the sick, thousands of them will come. And there were so many people, but they were so responsive. You know, the moment you just give what we call an altar call, they all rush forward for prayer. And there were so many people, I can't pray for them one one at a time, definitely. So all I need to do was, all I can do is just stretch out my hand and just say, in the name of Jesus, you know, I bind the works of the devil, I speak healing, and... The moment I did that, the power of God would fall on the people. People were throwing away their crutches. You know, they were just things, the bandages were just slipping off. And they were dancing around as the power of God began healing the people by the dozens. Just a couple of examples. There was one young lady uh, who was deaf and dumb. And she came from quite a distance to the meeting. And uh, the reason why she was deaf and dumb was when she was uh, 11 years old, the, her mother hit her with a stool on her head. And as a result of that, she lost her speech and lost her hearing. So now she's in her 20s, you come to the service. I just said this uh, uh, mass prayer, so to speak. And uh, they were asking for testimonies. There were some people who came out and testified, but she wasn't one of them. Because at that time, immediately, there was no sign of healing. But when she went home that night, the moment she arrived at her own village, she started shouting for the first time in more than 10 years. Then another lady also came and testified how she was going blind, river blindness. Right? She was not able to read. Uh, she would, the eyes were getting dimmer and dimmer. Again, after the mass prayer, nothing happened at that point. But she went home that night. She... When she went to bed, after she, she fell asleep, she had a dream. She saw a man dressed in white. And at that time, I was dressed in white. Okay? And, uh, and she saw this man coming to her in her dream, poked two needles into her eyes, and extracted two clots of, uh, 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 a clot of blood from each eye. Then she woke up, and she was tearing. The, 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 the tears were just flowing from her. The next morning, she was just tearing. So she went to wash opened the Bible and read perfectly. There were other people, you know, the, the, the crutches were, were, they were throwing away their crutches, they were dancing. My faith went up a thousandfold because of that experience in Ghana. The giant of fear in me, of the unknown, of my wild imagination of what can happen in a place like Africa 
when a tumbling down through the power of the Holy Spirit. What's your giant? What's keeping you from following Jesus Christ wholeheartedly? Going anywhere He wants you to go? Doing anything He wants you to do? Let's recap the five stones to knock out giants. What are they? First, a great cause. The greatest cause for you and me is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, the transformation of men and women into servants, to the children and servants of God Almighty through Jesus Christ. Then the price to pay. Yes, anything worth doing will have a price, will have a cost. Then a track record. Start now. What is it that you have in your hand? Put it to practice. Put it to good use. Do something with what God has given to you and see miracles coming out of the simple things you offer to God. And fourthly, we have an almighty God to trust. He will never let you down. He will never shortchange you. Then finally, there's a big target to hit. A giant, yes, he can be intimidating. Yeah, it can paralyze you. It can demoralize you. But he is too big to miss. Let's capture that spirit of the shepherd boy David, the spirit of the living God. He is in you. And if you have never received him, today say, Holy Spirit, come, fill me. I want to kill my giant. In Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this wonderful account of how you took one young man, brought him into a place of challenge, and saw him fulfilling his purpose. God, this is your plan for all of us. I pray right now you write this, you write this story, you write this, these pictures, this movie, oh God, of David killing Goliath into our spiritual memory, into our imagination. And that we will rise up, that we will not be afraid. Hallelujah. That we will be giant killers. We will fulfill the great calling of God, the good works that you have prepared for every single one of us to fulfill. Thank you, Lord, that when you call, you will you are also faithful. You will also perform in us and through us. So I commit my brothers and sisters to you that even as they face the challenges in their lives, in their time, you will release, O oh God, these truths that we have shared together today, that the warriors in us will arise, the champions in us will take our stand, that we will break those records, O oh God, those barriers that have been put against us, those limits that have surrounded us in the name of Jesus, that your name will be glorified and your kingdom extended. In Jesus' name, everybody say, Amen. Greater than 
the battle raging in my mind I will trust you Lord I will fear no I lift my eyes I will lift my eyes I will lift my cares lay them in your hands I will defend them when the wind and waves are coming you shelter me even though I'm in the storm the storm is not in me you're my courage when I worry in the dead of night you're my strength cause I'm not strong enough to win this fight you are greater than the battle raging in my mind I will trust against me cause you have overcome come on sing it no darkness can overwhelm me cause you already won no power no power can come against me cause you have overcome no darkness can overwhelm me cause you've already won you're my courage when I worry in the dead of night you're my strength cause I'm strong enough to win this fight. You are greater than the battle raging in my mind. I will trust you, Lord. I will fear no more. Thank you for following our service and listening to my preaching. And I do pray that what I've shared with you today uh, would just bring steel into your spirit and soul. That you will rise up, that whatever challenges you face, you will gain the wisdom and the, and the wherewithal uh, to fight and conquer your giants. So as we go back into our places of work and family and whatever situation God, the Lord has placed you, may what we have shared today continue to inspire you, equip you, and give you the victory. Next week, we have a guest preacher, and many of you uh, know of him and have enjoyed his ministry. Okay, it's none other than Pastor Eugene Sell. Right, so look forward to it and invite friends to come online with us next week. So now, let's bless one another in Jesus' name. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you. The Lord upon you and be gracious unto you and be gracious unto you Lord lift up His countenance on you and give you peace and be gracious unto you and be great.